Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to session H3 titled Measuring Resilience. My name is Steve Ferryman. I'm the State Hazard Mitigation Officer for Ohio, and we have several uh, great speakers lined up for you this afternoon. First of which is Ashby Worley. She is a Coastal Resilience Manager with the Nature Conservancy. And with that, Ashby, please take it away. Hello, my name is Ashby Nix Worley, and I'll be talking to you a little bit about using decision support tools to build a more resilient Georgia coast. So if you're familiar with the Nature Conservancy, you're likely familiar with their land conservation efforts across the world. We were founded in the U.S. in 1951 and are a 501c3 nonprofit. We have over 400 scientists on our team and work globally in 72 countries and six continents. In the state of Georgia, we work primarily on conserving the lands and waters in which all life depends. And this is primarily based on four, or excuse me, five pillars of work in the state. Um, our work on healthy cities, conserving critical lands, which is probably what you're most familiar with, with land conservation, securing abundant and clean water with our fresh water and forest work, inspiring conservation action, and also planning for a stronger coast and healthier ocean, which is where our work on coastal resilience comes in. So when we're speaking about the coast of Georgia and climate change, I first want to introduce you to some of the um, impacts that our coast has been experiencing over the last um, several years. Uh, the picture in the upper right hand corner is a picture of Highway 80, which connects the city of Tybee um, and the island of Tybee to the city of uh, Savannah. And this is on a, what we would consider a spring tide or a king tide day. So a sunny day flooding event, um, not associated with any storm activity. This is where we're starting to see impacts of coastal flooding in Georgia. Um, and that's only been exacerbated by the presence of a couple of hurricanes over the last several years, primarily in 2016 and 2017 with hurricanes Matthew and Irma impacting our coast with a lot of flooding. At the same time, we're also starting to experience the impacts of sea level rise as that slow moving encroaching water is starting to get higher and higher on our low lying area of the coast and um, creating some um, saltwater inundation in areas. And of course, all of this flooding um, really creates some issues with erosional banks and beaches um, that are affecting communities in some of our coastal uh, areas. And at the same time, our Georgia coast and, and the world's coast are experiencing this increase in coastal hazards. We're also seeing an increase in our coastal population. Coastal areas like Georgia and in general the southeast are desired areas for um, people to retire to and to move to to live near near the beaches and our, our warm weather. And uh, so we're seeing more and more of these areas become highly developed and increasing in population. And it's really this increase in both coastal hazards and a coastal population that's creating a vulnerable uh, uh, community and natural systems as these areas get developed and feel the pressure of those populations. So to give you a little bit more of a picture of what our coastal Georgia looks like, um, this is a, a snapshot from NOAA's coastal flood exposure mapper. And it's really just a compilation of various types of um, flooding threats to our Georgia coast. And that's including shallow coastal flooding, FEMA flood zones, storm surge, and sea level rise. And the segment um, that you're looking at here is actually um, a segment of our coast starting about Savannah area in the northern part and then ends at about Jacksonville in the southern part. And really what this is exhibiting is some of those kind of low, low country areas um, that extends beyond South Carolina and into the Georgia coast, which is about 100 miles. Um, our Georgia coast is also home to a third of the east coast uh, salt marsh wetlands. And so we've got expansive amounts of salt marsh and tidal freshwater swamp um, in our coastal area. And this also, this map also shows that our low-lying areas are not only um, along the immediate coastline, along with our barrier islands, but really extend inland, sometimes one or two counties inland to those swamps and riverine areas um, where five major rivers empty into our Georgia coast. And of course, all of this flooding and impact of climate change um, has both a social and an economic impact on our coast 
here are some pictures of some of the coastal flooding and, and storm surge impacts that our coast experienced um, a couple of years ago as, as it encroached on beach areas and eroded our coastal areas, um, flooded areas, as you can see with the boat um, sitting on a picnic table, and then also flooding out some of our low-lying communities, um, as the picture on the far left uh, shows. And really it's about um, you know, this coastal area that is much like other coastal areas. We're primarily a lot of, uh, a significant number of people live in these coastal areas and significant amount of property, residential property, is considered to be in high risk areas or high hazard areas. And sea level rise will increase the amount of these highly threatened people and properties by 30 to 60% by the year 2100. And specifically for Georgia, when we're looking at our populations and what's predicted to be impacted, it's between 60 and 160,000 Georgians impacted by sea level rise by the year 2100. So there is good news in that Georgia and much of our coastal areas um, in the United States are uh, uh, bordered by natural, uh, natural systems that help reduce flood risk. That can include dune systems, oyster reefs, um, marshes and wetlands, floodplains, and other open space areas that have served an important role in reducing risk to these coastal areas and will continue to serve an important role in doing so. And the science is starting to show this as well. Um, Mike Beck et al. with the Nature Conservancy showed that coastal wetlands prevented over 600,000 or 600 million dollars in flood damages to private property during Hurricane Sandy. And again, a majority of our U.S. coastline is protected by natural habitat, but if we were to lose that, then it would only increase the number of vulnerable populations um, in harm's way. So in Georgia, with our Coastal Resilience Program, our focus is really to build a resilient Georgia coast that ensures that these natural systems thrive into the future, not only for their other ecological services, but for their risk reduction reduction services so that it can help protect communities in the future faced with climate change. This is a great um, kind of uh, diagram here that helps show additional benefits um, of those natural systems. So our southeast uh, areas, um, primarily Georgia, has uh, oyster reefs, um, marshes, um, and other uh, natural floodplains that are serving a great service to our communities today. And with the Nature Conservancy's approach to coastal resilience, we work directly with coastal communities on building a more resilient coast. Um, we work with them on assessing risk, so that's looking at flood damage or, or challenges around um, flooding issues, and then working with them to determine what kind of nature-based solutions can we bring to the table or work with them on that may help reduce flood risk. We then take action with that community and do a project and then measure its effectiveness. And in time, we may be able to scale or replicate a successful project to other areas or across, across the larger coastal area. When we began this work in 2016, we did so alongside our um, co-workers in the Nature Conservancy as we each picked a large or a, um, a coastal community and uh, as a pilot community, as a place to start this work and to learn and engage and also learn across the region about success stories, about challenges and similarities and differences among our communities and what they were facing in terms of risk. Specifically for Georgia, we focused on Camden County, which is the southernmost county in, southernmost coastal county in Georgia. Um, if you're familiar with Cumberland Island National, sea National Seashore, um, this is the, um, the county in which that resides. Camden County has had ex um, quite a bit of experience with coastal flooding, um, primarily around its riverine, two rivers that, um, that empty into the Atlantic uh, through Camden County, that's the St. Mary's and Satilla River, which do periodically flood about every four to five years. So that picture in the lower right-hand corner is a picture of that flooding. So they had had experience with flooding previously, primarily in those river areas. But over the last couple of years, as I mentioned, they started to experience the impacts of storm surge on their communities. Um, these are pictures of the coastal um, city of St. Mary's um, business, as well as even uh, some flooding that occurred on the very western part of the county, which is 
surprisingly in an X zone and therefore some maintenance uh, ditch uh, was not draining very well and therefore created some flooding regime or a flooding uh, issue in that area, um, primarily due to the amount of precipitation that came down during one of the storms. Another thing that happened to this community during our conversations is that their, um, their firm maps, the new firm maps came out and we're actually showing areas to be at less risk of flooding or the lower lowering the base flood elevation for numerous um, areas east of 95. And many of these areas actually had just been flooded by the hurricanes. So it was really sending some mixed messages on flood risk for the community. And at the bottom part of this uh, page shows the relative sea level trend for Fernandina Beach, which is just right around the corner from this community. And so this is kind of showing what kind of, um, what the sea level rise has looked like over the last hundred years. And this is a diagram from NOAA that shows you really what this community could be experiencing in the near future. Uh, this is showing a range of scenarios for sea level rise up to the year 2100. And this is based on um, some, uh, on science. This is NOAA's most recent um, information on sea level rise and shows different scenarios based on what may um, happen in the near future with regards to carbon or uh, ice melting and whatnot. So what this is really showing is that our, our communities in Georgia um, could be, be experiencing between nine inches and up to about uh, three feet of sea level rise by the year 2050 and between about one foot and about a little over 10 feet by the year 2100. And also I want to add here that um, our southeast coastal area is supposed to be experiencing a 27% higher relative sea level rise compared to the global average. And I want to play for you a video briefly of, uh, of some of the impact that that storm surge had on the coastal community of St. Mary's. So that gives you a taste a little bit of the impact these storms are having on this coastal community. This is all uh, part of the conversation that we've been having with Camden County and the city of St. Mary's about what are their resilience needs, what have been their challenges through these two hurricanes and their previous flooding events, and what ways in which the Nature Conservancy can work with them to address some of these issues. And that's really what this diagram is showing, is that there's that sweet spot that both preserves and protects nature, but also helps address some of the essential community needs around resilience. And the Nature Conservancy has over 10 years of experience with um, creating decision support tools with communities that will help address resilience and build more flood resilience in your communities. Um, from community planning to future habitat maps, um, you know, uh, GIS information on risk and restoration. Um, this is information that's able to be uh, plugged into a decision support tool and released to the communities to be used for decision making in their communities. So really where we landed with Camden County on this project is around creating a flood risk awareness tool 
They really wanted to be able to get information out about flood risk, not only sea level rise, but storm surge, FEMA flood maps, and other flood information in a friendly and easily accessible way to their public. They also wanted to be able to pair this information with their uh, very localized community data. That could be roads, parcel information, zoning, future land use, um, essential, um, essential infrastructure, and really be able to look at that uh, with flood risk information that's not only current, but also projects future um, flood risk and extents. And then lastly, we worked with them on a community rating system Open Space Explorer, which is a tool that helps communities identify open space areas in which they could be receiving CRS points for today, as well as a, a tool that helps them prioritize what areas may be, um, may be preserved and, uh, and added to their CRS score in order to get, um, and added to their points in order to get a better CRS score and therefore um, insurance savings for their community. So these are really the three main, what we call web applications or tools in which we created with the community hand to hand. And of course we can't do this kind of work by ourselves. Uh, we reached out to key partners like NOAA for, um, for funding, Georgia Department of Natural Resources and University of Georgia Marine Extension and Sea Grant for their partnership and their expertise. We partnered directly with the county and the city to make sure we were serving their needs and bringing in their local data, and also the Coastal Regional Commission, which helps with GIS support for these communities. Um, just a little bit of background also, the um, Camden County does not have an actual in-house GIS team, so we were able to provide some tools that uh, they maybe wouldn't have access to um, otherwise. So the process in which this took is really applying for funding, to create the project and create the tools, then uh, holding actually several community workshops with key focus groups like community planners, builders, insurance agents, um, local decision makers, about what kind of tools could they use? What kind of tools are they already using? Are there gaps in tools um, and functionality? And basically taking all of that information and creating some tools that help serve those needs. We then rolled those back out to these focus groups for beta testing and kind of um, really uh, tweaking some of those, those tools to make sure that they were user friendly and uh, filling those, those gaps and needs. And right now we're in the tool trainings and community outreach uh, phase of our project where we're starting to get these tools back out to the community, making sure that they know they have, that they're aware of them, they know how to access them and can give them some examples of how to use them. Now our landing page for all these tools is at coastalresilience.org, Georgia. Um, there are tools also for other states that are listed on this um, platform as well. Um, it is complete with a project description. It's got links to the three tools I mentioned, a story map, a tutorial, links to recent articles that are related to flood resilience for that community, and a downloadable fact sheet that can be printed and shared. This is a, a screenshot of our fact sheet. Um, which um, we have copies of that sit in the um, floodplain management office and other areas in the county and city. And really this is just talking about flood risk, why you should be aware of your flood risk for your property and, and surrounding areas, how to use the tools that we created. Also, it's got some handy diagrams there about sea level rise and the impacts of storm surge on property over time. And also, lastly, we've got links to the local resources, so your community development office, your planning and development, your floodplain management, about um, as resources to go to if you're looking to build a home, you know, trying to determine free board or anything like that as a developer or a, or a homeowner. So we've got several links there. So let's dive into the tool. Bringing up right now the flood risk and community planning tools, all of these tools can be used interchangeably with each other. They each kind of provide a certain um, uh, group of data to the platform. The flood risk tool really brings up uh, sea level rise, storm surge, and your FEMA flood maps and allows you to toggle between different types of years or different scenarios. So here we have exhibited um, sea level rise and using the intermediate high scenario for sea level rise based on that graph I showed previously, 
And then you can change the year. So here we have shown year 2075. And this is zoomed into the city of St. Mary's. I've also layered um, some layers here from the community planning tool. The community planning tool includes all of that local data that the um, local decision makers want to include. That could be parks, preserved areas, your parcel data, your zoning, future land use maps, critical infrastructure. So you're able to kind of layer any of this material that you want on top of each other and even change the um, uh, opacity of it so that you can see through multiple layers. This next example is uh, really just bringing up some of that critical infrastructure data. So I've got up culverts information for the county. I've also highlighted a fire department and then also clicked on the FEMA firm map um, data layer, which is shown in the map legend. So this might be helpful if you were building a new fire station or were concerned about the flood um, risk of a community uh, asset like a fire station and perhaps even, you know, what the culverts, um, you know, what floodplain the culverts may be in and also perhaps what the risk is of flooding or inundated with storm surge or sea level rise. And lastly, another example is, um, is layering that sea level rise data, as I've shown here, with uh, zoning. So right here we have uh, well, actually future land use for the city of St. Mary's. So you can see that we have um, some flooding predicted for 2075 under the intermediate high sea level rise scenario. And that's primarily going to be hitting some of those um, commercial areas right on the waterfront in the city of St. Mary's. And I'll add here too that there's a small um, picture that uh, we have several pictures throughout the county in which we're able to superimpose a projected sea level rise uh, picture onto. So you can see here in the far left corner where you can um, see or visualize what that sea level rise may look like on a building. And whenever you change the sea level rise year, that uh, water level will change appropriately with that. This is a picture up close of that image. And there's a mobile friendly version of this tool, which uh, can be found on the website as well. We really wanted to make this easy for the general public to access. And so therefore they're able to click on their, um, the mobile friendly version and bring this up and explore sea level rise, storm surge, and, and FEMA flood map information by just putting in their address and changing the toggle on the climate year. Lastly, I'll say a few words about the community rating system open space explorer app, which has just been completed for these two communities. This is really highlighting the eligible, um, eligible areas for open space within, the, uh, within Camden County and also states how many of the points have already been published or approved um, for CRS and, and which they're already getting points for. As you can tell here, this um, platform shows that it's a current class of six, contributing 712 out of over 2,000 total CRS points. In the next slide, this slide shows you how it can be used to identify future potential areas for, um, for conservation. So I've put in the search engine here, show me eligible acres that are eligible properties that are over 500 acres but cost less than half a million dollars. And those are highlighted in blue. I then click on one of them, that's the one highlighted in red, and it shows that that parcel um, could provide six additional points for CRS if it was put under a conservation easement or preserved in some way. So this is allowing the local community to really identify what areas would be biggest bang for your buck in terms of preserving um, or putting in, in conservation open space areas that then result in CRS uh, points for the community. And I'm glad to see that the Camden County and City of St. Mary's have added these materials to their websites um, and that they're using them and we're tracking that information to just follow where this data, um, where these tools are being used and they can be easily accessed by the county and city floodplain websites. Lastly, just kind of where, where does it go from here? Uh, we're right in the middle of trainings and outreach. We're having to turn these over to virtual trainings and outreach for the community. Um, as we lead up and work through hurricane season, and we'll be tracking the tool use through that. We're also 
using this tool as a way to jump into the next stage and being, being able to identify on the ground projects, um, nature-based solution projects in Camden County and surrounding areas. And just an anecdote there that, that even just using this tool and doing some of the trainings, local officials have really become interested in seeing what the future of their community looks like with sea level rise and they're starting to engage in um, discussions about what kind of projects and land conservation um, can happen to help uh, prepare that community for the future with more flooding. And then lastly, the CRS tool, we're hoping to be able to perfect that in Camden and St. Mary's, and then perhaps roll that across um, other communities in coastal Georgia as interested or as we're able to uh, with additional funding. So I thank you for your time and I welcome any of your questions. Hey Ashby, thank you very much for that great presentation and, and thank you for uh, being with us today to answer some questions. We've had a few questions pop up uh, in the box there. Please continue to, to submit those. Um, we'll start with the, the one at the top here. Has your FEMA regional office contributed to or supported that work that you were doing? Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks, Steve. Um, they have not contributed directly in terms of um, partnership or anything like that, but we certainly have been um, using the FEMA data, um, such as the for, uh, updated firm map data, uh, to bring into the tool. And, and we have discussed it with our, our uh, state GEMA, um, Georgia um, Emergency Management Agency. So we are in contact with them a little bit on the tool, but as we start to roll this out, we welcome more partnerships to see where we want to bring this tool to other uh, locations or communities or just improve it um, in time in the future. So always happy to, to, to have that partnership and communication. Great. I'm glad that you mentioned the uh, Georgia Emergency Management Association, too. I've worked with them uh, in the mm -hmm. past and done mm -hmm. uh, some work uh, with EMAP through through that organization, and they're really great to work with. I'm curious if uh, any of the communities that you were working with have plans to uh, pursue hazard mitigation assistance grant funding in the future to, to help uh, you know get the word out about resilience and implement some projects that will help your, your efforts in the long term. Yeah, well, the communities that we've been working with, with particularly Camden and St. Mary's, certainly have applied for hazard mitigation um, funding, primarily for, for issues or challenges in which they're facing today, you know, known flooding locations or issues or, um, or things like that. But I think what this tool can help us envision is where those next issues are going to be popping up and, and should be looked at and you know, perhaps planning and funding obtained to prevent those from becoming issues down the road. So I think that's really where this tool can, can be most useful. Okay. Uh, could, you, could you characterize an increase in resilience as a metric for how much passive communication, for example, websites versus active communication tools, ads, billboards, meetings? It, it, can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, we're certainly tracking that information as we start to roll these tools out in the community and, and you know, do these training events and, and really get them to be used by the intended users, the decision makers and the general public. So we're tracking all those metrics on the back end. Um, but I think that that time will tell in terms of you know the adoption of these tools by the partners. Um, for their decision making, like the floodplain managers and the board, the zoning boards and the historic preservation boards to really show what that impact is going to be in the long run. So we're certainly tracking the where we're where we're getting the word out and our outreach events and our, um, our our fact sheets and things like that and website hits. And we can also track uh, through the tool who's using it in terms of location and and length of time that they're using it. So we've got all those numbers and we'll continue to, to track those, but I think it's really gonna be um, important to really see the long run use of these tools uh, beyond the project year, really. Okay, another question here. Have, have you linked Camden staff with any local land trust that may mm -hmm. be interested in working with the community on conserving potential CRS er earning properties? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so that's really where our head is now as we're finalizing that CRS Open Space Explorer and starting to, to explore how do we do some virtual trainings on this. Um, 
we don't have, unfortunately, we don't have any coastal Georgia land trust. Um, we are kind of, uh, we do have some land trust across the state that will work in this area. So we just have to be a little bit creative about um, and do a little additional outreach about what land trusts work in this area. You know, also, um, you know, what are the county's interests in preserving these or just working with the landowner to preserve them. Um, I know a lot of the programs that are active in this area are like NRCS with their um, wetland reserve easements and things like that. So some of those ideas and uh, resources may come into play. So that's part of the process that we're in right now. Good idea. Great. Uh, question, do you have recommendations on how to best incorporate uh, resilience into the FEMA mitigation planning process based on the tools that you developed here as part of this project? Yeah, I think that this tool or this set of tools can really be helpful um, to communities as they start to, for instance, uh, create their hazard mitigation plan. Uh, Camden County is doing an update actually this year with their hazard mitigation plan, and we're a part of that team, which is great to be invited um, and I think that the use of this tool can help exhibit what those long-term concerns are and flood risks are across the county um, and start to bring in that conversation. I know that that has been a part of the conversation in the past, but hopefully this tool makes it a little bit easier. And then the community that's been involved with creating this are, are now familiar with um, the flood risks and, and the use of this tool. So hopefully it'll be uh, front of mind and forefront of uh, that conversation. So that's one example that I can think of. All right, we have time for one more question here. Um, if, if folks are interested in finding out some more information about your tools, uh, how can they do that? Yeah, um, so the Nature Conservancy has a great website, um, coastalresilience.org. It has a lot of resources on there, not only about um, the tools for Camden County and St. Mary's, but also tools for other areas. I know North Carolina has a, set, a a wide variety of tools accessible for their coastal area, um, South Carolina as well, I think Virginia and New Jersey. So not only are the tools on there, but there's also all kinds of resources about who can you contact if you're interested in maybe bringing these types of tools to your community. Um, also just general information about the tools. So what does that CRS Open Space Explorer do? You know, some fact sheets about that, um, how you can ask questions about it or get engaged in that um, and a project like that. So there's lots of resources there to explore also success stories and just uh, snippets of information about how these tools have been used in communities. So feel free to check it out and reach out to your local TNC contact if you have questions. Great, Ashby, thank you very much. I appreciate your time today. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me. All right, our next speaker is uh, Jay Park. He's an associate vice president with AECOM, and the title of his presentation is Empirical Disaster Resilience Study in North Carolina. And Jay, take it away. Good afternoon. Welcome to AASPM mitigation session. My name is Jay Park with AECOM, and I want to thank all of you attending the conference virtually. I wish we all are in Texas enjoying barbecue with country music. Today, I want to share my research findings on measuring disaster resilience in the state of North Carolina observed after Hurricane Floyd and the Matthew. I will discuss five major topics today. First, research inspirations and the purpose of the study. Second, impact of Hurricane Floyd and the resilience building efforts. Third, resilience indicators in this study. Fourth, findings. Last, conclusions and the lesson learned and the recommendation for next studies. The tree shown on this slide is from Joplin, Missouri, painted by native people after hit by tornado EF5 back in 2011 which symbolize resilience and the strong will of the city to rebuild. Now the city is just not just recovered from the tornado, but even built stronger and better. So this symbolism of resilience triggered interest to explore why some communities recover from disasters faster and better and some are not. The chart 
in this slide shows trend of billion dollar disasters since 1980. And not only the number of disasters has increased, but also the magnitude of each disaster has been significantly larger. So we would like to know whether we as a society learned from past disasters and what mitigation and recovery actions taken to enhance resilience in our communities. In order to achieve the research goals, we applied two research approaches. The first one is exploratory examination of indicators of resilience, and the second, examination of losses avoided due to implementing hazard mitigation activities and recoveries after disasters. Due to time and money constraint, we picked only six North Carolina counties that they experienced both Hurricane Floyd and the Matthew disasters. They are Bertie County, Columbus, Edgecombe, Lenore, Robertson, and the Wayne counties. So, what happened in 1999 as a result of Hurricane Floyd in the state of North Carolina? Hurricane Floyd made landfall September 16, 1999 at Cape Fear, North Carolina as a Category 2 storm with wind speed of 105 miles per hour. It accompanied by 10 to 15 feet high storm surges and the heavy rainfall of 20 inches. It devastated North Carolina, especially Eastern North Carolina, uh, damaged more than 50,000 homes, and economic damage was tremendous, especially agricultural sector was devastated. On the other hand, Hurricane Matthew damaged more homes than business, and then also it has more heavy impact on central region than eastern regions. After Hurricane Floyd, one of the most significant recovery efforts was establishment of Hurricane Floyd Disaster Relief Commission by state legislature and strongly sponsored by governor. Its major activities include the creating a disaster reserve fund for future disasters and then also established Disaster Studies Institute to facilitate and coordinate research on disaster planning, response, recovery, and mitigation. Third, that it mandated long-term recovery planning into emergency management operation. So emergency management must consider recovery uh, after the post-disaster recovery operation and planning. And lastly, also that commission funded updating the statewide flood insurance rate map using LIDAR technology. Until that time, that all flood maps in North Carolina were so outdated, and then it was on the paper-based map. So updating flood maps and the flood risk management were the higher priorities. Also, the state heavily in invested on public outreach, education, and warning systems after maps were updated. In addition, the state spent more than $1 billion in recovery and resilience activities, such as hazard mitigation project. $300 million was spent for property bias, elevation, stormwater management type project, HUD CDBG disaster recovery funding was spent on housing recovery and economic uh, development. And also FEMA spent uh, public assistance program funding to repair and uh, rebuild the road, bridges, and water wastewater treatment plant and other public facilities. So we thought state of North Carolina would be a good candidate to measure how they build resilience and perform during recent hurricane event. 
First of all, our team identified over 50 resilience indicators from literature review. Then we narrowed down to 27 uh, after removing duplications and then also we checked some of the data availability and um, we ended up 17 indicators in this study. The reason the, we removing 10 additional indicators from 27 common resilience indicators was uh, many of the communities do not have the data we, 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 we are looking for. And then also, right after disaster, we do not have a long-term recovery impact data either. So we eliminated those uh, factors. And then also another thing I want to uh, point out is the state of North Carolina mandated many resilience um, performance measures. For example, the state mandated uh, uh, building code adoption, uh, free board, uh, NFIP program participation, and then also they uh, mandate hazard mitigation plans, things like that. So those are the very important factors for the other communities, but in North Carolina, it was mandated. So there's no differences among communities. So we ended up removing those factors, indicators. Now that those 17 resilience indicators uh, we categorize into four different buckets and I put it into there. The first one is the social resilience, second, economic resilience, third, physical resilience, fourth one is disaster management resilience indicators. Social resilience indicator is the capacity of social entities to bounce back or respond positively to an adverse impact or hazard event. The economic resilience is uh, also economic aspects of how the community will resume and re come back to their uh, normal economic activities right after disaster. And the third category, the physical resilience, is the actually include both built as well as natural uh, environment. As you know, built environment include buildings, bridges, and road, and you know, uh, public facilities. If your building is built up to a most recent code uh, with the disaster resistant code, your community is really uh, strong and that will sustain most disasters. And finally, disaster management indicators are related to community ability and the preparation to manage the impact of disasters. This may include emergency plans, mitigation plans, and the systems, um, you know, how emergency operations center will operate and the coordinate. All those things will have impact on disaster management resilience. Here is the list of the final 17 resilience indicators based on data availabilities in the communities. Some important indicators such as building code, free board, hazard mitigation recovery plan requirements are removed because there is no difference among communities, as I mentioned in the previous slide. Also, another example is local social groups. They play a very important role in disaster recovery and providing assistance to the community members, but we could not collect at the community level. So we ended up eliminating uh, the factors. And another interesting thing was the access to the vehicle. As you know, without car, it's hard to evacuate and then relocate and then also go back to work. So the access to vehicle was a very important indicators uh, how quickly you're going to go back and uh, resume your economic activities in the community. Now, this slide shows uh, dependent variables uh, which are focused on measuring impact of disaster and the speed of recovery. 
So you are independent variables um, that, you know, vehicle, education or other factors now impacting how quickly your community can recover from disaster. So in this study, following data were examined. First, that number of schools closed. So if your community have a really significant impact, then it's going to take longer to uh, open your schools. And then also the number of days a disaster recovery center operated. If your community suffered, uh, you know, that level of damage is uh, significant, that it requires longer community recovery center operations. And then also, of course, that, you know, your, your, your community has a devastating impact on the infrastructure that road, bridges, washed away, of course it's going to take a long time to recover. And then also, um, if your community is built up to code uh, and then, you know, up to the NFIP ordinance, then you will uh, suffer less damages. So we want to look at those uh, NFIP payment. And then also, if you are not insured, then you may be eligible for FEMA individual and household program assistance. So we want to look at those. And then, of course, the public assistance program payment. If your community, uh, you know, infrastructure is less prepared, less resilient, then you're going to have more damages. So we want to look at those uh, payment uh, too. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about major findings of the study. First, for social resilience, that our research shows the income level and the home ownership have positive relationships. So higher the income, and if you have a home ownership, then you will be better off. And second, physical resilience, housing type really matters. You know, what kind of house you live in, mobile home or stick built home or pre-code or you know, post-code, all those things are really important, it matters. And the third, that communities required uh, or repaired or rebuilt road after Hurricane Floyd, which will be likely built uh, up to code and uh, built stronger. So your communities uh, have less time to recover and open your communities. And then finally, if your community implemented property buyouts uh, after Hurricane Floyd and then following disasters, uh, those communities avoided uh, damages to the properties. And then I will show you the uh, huge savings. Now, that as you can see on the slide, that social resilience indicators, the graph, it shows uh, that the higher number of low mother income resident in your community, it requires longer time that providing assistance to those residents. So you have to have longer disaster recovery centers operations. And then also those communities took longer time to open school. So kids have to stay out and uh, parents, you know, repair home, then that school can be opened. I want to point out one thing that important for these all findings. Uh, even though it shows a graph and then, you know, correlations, but because low number of samples, I cannot say they are, you know, highly correlated or significant statistically. So this is more uh, showing the trend rather than statistical significance of the findings. Another important uh, finding on social resilience indicator is that higher rate of home ownership really contributed to quicker uh, close of disaster recovery centers and the return to school. So if you have a higher rate of home ownership in a community, then you are going to less require the government assistance and then also you will be uh, uh, ready to go to back to school. So that's another finding. And the next slide uh, shows the uh, physical uh, indicators of resilience. Um, that one example is if you live in mobile home, 
then you will be likely suffer uh, significant damage than that someone who live in stupid house. And then also you're going to require more assistance to recover. This finding is uh, very consistent with Dr. Susan Cutter's findings and then reflected in SOBI index. Next slide uh, shows uh, physical indicators of resilience. Uh, finally, the, the, those communities who will receive uh, FEMA public assistance funding to repair uh, and reconstruct the road and bridges after Hurricane Floyd in 1999, uh, they experienced a fewer number of road and bridge closures during and after Hurricane Matthew. So that's also consistent with others too. This slide shows um, buyer properties and the Matthew flood deaths uh, in Etchcombe and the Lenoir County as an example. The red dots uh, represent uh, locations of acquired properties after Hurricane Floyd and the just before the Hurricane Matthew. And if they are not required, that those homes probably experience uh, you know, minimum as one to uh, 10 feet flooding, uh, depending on the location. The darker the blue colors, that shows uh, about 10 feet of uh, flooding depths. This uh, table on the slide shows total number of buyouts in the six study counties, along with total project cost and the losses avoided. The government paid $170 million to purchase 1,138 properties after Hurricane Floyd. Now it ended up saving $133 million, which translates into 1.14 return on investment, which is pretty good return on investment. And this is the one of the major disaster event. So we are going to witness further savings down the road. So this is excellent uh, investment and the proof of mitigation activities. In conclusion, we were able to uh, observe uh, several hazard mitigation and recovery activities that were implemented over time have a positive impact on community disaster resilience building. However, it is hard to establish statistical significance due to the small sample size. I recommend at least 50 to 100 communities with the mixed size of communities in the future. Also, the size matters. Uh, if community is too small, we struggle to find uh, necessary data. So if community is less than uh, 15,000 or 20,000 communities, they may not have enough data to show that building code activities, mitigation planning activities and others. So um, the next study should consider building size too. And then here's the last slide. I want to share the lessons learned and the recommendations for the future studies. Uh, certainly, we need to invest uh, tracking long-term disaster impact and then recovery activities. Uh, this study was uh, completed uh, around 12 months to 18 months after Hurricane Matthew. So we uh, uh, could not collect uh, perishable data right after disaster happened. So we uh, were unable to collect data day activities uh, within the uh, uh, 60 days or 90 days of a disaster impact uh, and then also long-term ones. So um, we strongly recommend the, the, the funding research organizations to fund to set up the questionnaires, templates, data collection method and the who to contact and you know all those things. So we can have a better uh, data uh, collection and analytical uh, result. 
That's all I have. Thank you for your time. And now I will take your question. Dr. Park, thank you for that excellent presentation. Uh, and it certainly has a lot of relevance uh, given everything that's going on uh, currently in our country today. Uh, we have a, a number of questions rolling in here. So we'll, we'll start with, uh, uh, there are several folks asking about if they want to uh, get their hands on the, the paper that you produced or more information about your studies. How might they do that? Uh, first of all, thank you, Steve, for moderating this session, and uh, thank you, everybody, uh, joining this session virtually. Uh, actually, this study was funded by DHS Science and Technology through University of uh, North Carolina Center for Coastal Resilience. So their website uh, should have a link to this study. And then also, as soon as we published on the UNC website, UN uh, DP that uh, resilience office uh, make a note of these findings and they also <laughs> uploaded their UN website. So if you Google UNC Chapel Hill uh, Coastal Resilience Center or uh, UN uh, the resilience office, then there are a web link and you can download the final report. Great. Uh, uh, a question here, uh, these indicators are super helpful for emergency managers to know what data points to highlight. Is there a publication or report of this work that we can use to take a closer look at? Uh, uh, yeah, I guess you answered the second part there, but uh, the, the, there's another question about the indicators about, uh, do you feel that the missing indicators made a difference in the study? And, and should there be some uh, effort uh, towards collecting that information? Absolutely. Uh, we believe, and then also other uh, researchers uh, believe that building code uh, make a huge difference. So if your community adopted the most recent building code, IRC, IBC, uh, that make a huge difference. Also, FEMA completed uh, the building code loss of soil study uh, indicate billions dollars reduction avoided losses. And then also uh, free board, also very important. But like I said, in North Carolina, two feet free board requirement in place before. Uh, so that is another uh, huge uh, benefit and the resilience indicators. And then uh, planning side, actually, I did not present here. We reviewed uh, planning integration, whether the hazard mitigation planning findings integrated into land use plan, uh, 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 subdivisions, capital improvement plans. So we looked at all those plans and the economic development plan. Uh, they are not consistent, but we found that more than half of counties in the study uh, integrated hazard mitigation findings into the plan. So that was very important, especially mitigating future impact in undeveloped areas. So we think those are the very important factors, but there's no difference among the communities. So uh, I wish we have a larger study samples to show the differences. Okay. Um. There's lots of comments in the chat box about it's great to see that uh, mitigation is paying off. And I know you had a slide in the presentation there about uh, after only one event where a number of the mitigation efforts had taken place, that there was a return and in investment on, uh, of 1.14, which is really great. Uh, you know, that the, those projects have already paid for themselves with just one event. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, uh, I know you uh, had uh, many elevation projects. Last year, I visited uh, Ohio State uh, field trip. Uh, I'm sure over time, you know, the investment we make for buyouts or elevation project will pay out quickly. Just one event after uh, 2000, uh, 1999 and 2016, over you know, 18 years period, it's already paid off. So I think this is a great story and we need to publicize to Congress, lawmakers and the federal agents to you know, uh, uh, obligate more funding for a project like this. 
that that was, uh, leads right into my next question: Is are, are there any plans to uh, take this uh, study format to another state? It might be interesting uh, to compare, uh, you know, states using the same study methodology. Oh, absolutely! I'd love to do that, but just waiting for additional funding to do the <laughs> study. So that was the recommendation for uh, expanding this study uh, beyond North Carolina so we can compare you know, other states uh, with a stronger building code or other uh, practice, flood play management practice, and then you know, other ones. Uh, so we can compare those and the different sizes too. But it was only six communities after Hurricane Matthew as a pilot project. Okay. Is there any information uh, that uh, you didn't, you weren't able to fit into your presentation that you want to let folks know about now? Um, you know, actually, what uh, I thought is important many times, we think about money, solve many problems, your problem, my you know, household problem or community. A lot of people think money is a major factor to increase your community resilience, but you know, there are other factors like uh, uh, community organizations, uh, uh, faith-based communities or social organizations play very important role after disasters, building community cohesiveness and come back together. And then as a planner, you know, I'm a background uh, planner. So uh, importance of planning, I, as I mentioned to you, if we plan, utilize risk assessment findings, uh, into reflect into future land use plan, comprehensive plan to prohibiting future development in high hazard area. That saves even uh, return on investment will be hundred to one <laughs> ratio. <laughs> so uh, those are the things you know I definitely emphasize. Uh, and uh, study doesn't really point out that, but I think personally, that's how I thought uh, those can be highlighted. Great, thank you. You know, another interesting factor uh, to maybe take a look at if you do a future uh, study like this would be uh, how NFIP compliance within the particular communities that you might look at would also have an impact on, on you know, resilience. Oh, absolutely. So that, that was one of the criteria that uh, floodplain management ordinance and how they are different in the free board requirement. If your community requires, you know, one foot, two feet, or zero, then it will show a huge difference for flooding, especially. Uh, but North Carolina case, it was, uh, you know, same requirement. So uh, we didn't go uh, in depth in the compare that building uh, year of construction. If we look at that, I'm sure we will find pre-form structures suffer more damages compared to post-form uh, that built homes. So uh, that's a known factors, but I, you know, there was no difference for us and then uh, couldn't get the data. Great. Thank you very much, Jay. I appreciate uh, you being with us today and taking the time to answer those uh, questions. And uh, at this point, we're going to move on to our next presenter. So thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you all for uh, joining this uh, presentation. And thank you for submitting a lot of good questions. I enjoy it. OK, our next presenter is Mr. David Sutley. He is a senior project manager with Dewberry. And the title of his presentation is Show it in writing, R-E-L-I, as a means for documenting resilience. Welcome to this session. Thank you again for your participation in uh, the ASFBM conference, and especially since it's virtual this year for the first time. I want to keep this fun and light. Um, so with that, I think everyone in this session has a few things in common. Number one, we all have a deep passion for resilience. And number two, we all like to keep score. And I think that's going to be a big theme about how the Rely system is a great method for documenting resilience. So let's jump into it. I'm David Sutley. I'm a water resources engineer for Dewberry. And I wanted to discuss with everyone today what the Rely rating system is. Well, it's a rating system for, and a leadership standard 
that takes a holistic approach to resilient design. It is used by companies, developers, et cetera, to assess and plan for all of the acute hazards that buildings and communities can face during unplanned events, prepare to mitigate and prepare to mitigate against those hazards. Around the world, governments and businesses and developers are spearheading a growing movement to make structures in vulnerable communities more resilient through improved preventative action. The increasing frequency of dramatic weather events has brought an even greater urgency to create buildings and communities that are better adapted to a changing climate and better able to bounce back from disturbances and interruptions. Resilience is more than physically withstanding major natural disasters. It is a crucial factor in how we survive weather extremes, economic disruption, and resource depletion. Ultimately, it is about a community's ability to come together in the aftermath of an extreme event. The ability of a community to bounce back ultimately benefits everyone. Green buildings are one of the best ways companies and communities can future-proof, support climate action, improve quality of life, and make an immediate impact. Sustainable buildings are the cornerstone to enhancing community resilience. They are driving resilience, enhancing designs, technologies, materials, and methods. Administered by the Green Business Certification, Inc. relies a comprehensive approach, lays the groundwork for resilient, regenerative, and healthy outcomes that support quality of life. So how do we get here? Well, the road started in 2014 and was developed by a collaboration with the Institute for Market Transformation to Sustainability, MTS, Perkins and Will, and C3 Living Design Project. In 2015, it became a national consensus standard following the ANSI approved process and parts of the program were piloted on various projects. In 2017, the U.S. Green Building Council acquired the Rely Rating System for administration by the GBCI. The USGBC and MTS created a Rely Steering Committee composed of 16 people, eight of whom previously participated in the LEAD Resilience Working Group that was originally looking to incorporate resilience credits in the LEAD certification, project, lead certification process. And at this point, I wanted to to call out my colleague at Dewberry, Jane Franz, who was originally supposed to be here today presenting for, for everyone, and her participation in that original working group, as well as her continued participation in the Relies Steering Committee. So thank you, Jane, for your work on this and looking forward to sharing and the results from the session with you later. So with that, really, what is at the core of resilience? Well, Resilience acknowledges from the outset that things will go wrong. The statement on the screen alone is hard to, for us all to internalize. Building an expectation of adversity, shifting from a wish-based hope to a re reality-based hope. And that really is what is at the heart of resilience. So why does resilience matter? Well, we can talk about lives lost, dollars wasted, and shifts in our way of life. And green building is a widely recognized and valuable strategy to mitigate climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. However, scientific evidence clearly suggests that the Earth's climate will continue to change, even under the most aggressive emission reduction scenarios. The decisions we make about how to design, build, and operate buildings, communities, and cities have important consequences and will determine the severity of climate impacts. We all know that disasters drive displacement. And we've seen the incredible increase in the significant disaster-related losses in the past. The risk of people being displaced by natural disasters has quadrupled in the last 40 years. And increasing numbers of people will lose their homes to floods, earthquakes, and landslides in the future. An area that's near and dear to my heart, Dolphin Island, Alabama, is an example of one of those communities that doesn't have a ton of resources, that tried to implement preventative measures that were, have already been farly exceeded by the significant extreme events that have happened in the past. I personally have witnessed these impacts from Hurricane Ivan and just growing up down in the Gulf Coast and seeing the, the traumatic effects to the residents in these communities really bring significant awareness in what 
really needs to happen in the holistic approach that the Rely system can, in, can instill in communities and can really be a, a platform to enhancing resilience. So what are some of those benefits of resilience, resilient design? Well, let's start with a benefit cost breakdown. So the original estimate of a four to one investment on, of mitigation by FEMA has now been increased to a six to one as part of the 2018 interim report from the Natural Hazard Mitigation Saves Program. And the purpose of this study was really to help decision makers build a mitigation strategy so they can protect lives, property, and assets. And the findings indicate pretty substantial case of mitigation for all the hazards listed on the screen. So with that, let's move into really who benefits from resilient, resilient building. Well, of all the hazards listed above, you can kind of see how they're distributed across, but from a you know, jumping off the screen standpoint, tenants are really the ones that really benefit from a resilient building. They're the ones occupying or really having their life, led their business being in a, in a structure that is resilient can really help them get back on their feet following an extreme event. So let's discuss some of the rely fundamentals and really how the, this rating system works. Well, first off, the rely system is a, the initial registration to lead is required for the rely rating system. So if you're already registered for lead, then you're already on the right track. And if you select credits contributing to resilience when you are pursuing lead certified project, you are halfway there already. So let's start with the certification process. And there's really four major steps that are pretty consistent from rely and as well as lead. And that would be to register following your lead certification, apply for your rely certification, get your documents reviewed, identify any gaps you have, and then pursue your certification. The actual rating system is a point system, just like LEED, and goes up to a poss of 800 possible points with four levels of certification, 15 prerequisites, and 43 credit categories. The RELY scorecard is very similar to LEED, intentionally, and there are seven categories and one kind of innovative or creative category. And I'll briefly touch on some of the key pieces of each one of these. The panoramic approach has three prerequisites. The hazard preparedness focuses on emergency supplies and training. The hazard adaptation, which is probably one of the, is, is definitely one of the highest scored and more complex categories, really focuses on the design and engineering resilient strategies. Um, community vitality is another high, high scoring 200 point category. Productivity, health, and diversity is another category. The energy, energy, water, and food is where we will find clean power, energy, efficiency, and market good strategies. Materials and artifacts heavily references lead and is looking at that adaptability and flexibility as well as healthy materials. And if your project is pursuing something that goes above and beyond that, that's where that innovative category comes in for some extra points. So here's kind of a breakdown on the points as well as the corresponding lead categories and prerequisites. Across the board, you'll see that hazard adaptation and the community categories are the heaviest weighted. So with the interest of time, I really wanted to kind of highlight the hazard adaptation category and really share some work that Dewberry is doing to kind of help folks and communities make decisions about when to include hazard, hazard adaptation in their projects. So the hazard adaptation category really is wanting to focus on sites avoidance and repair based on um, hazards of, due to flooding from 500 year events and also climate informed science. We want to focus on the extreme weather, wildfire and seismic events to inform a safer design and to really prepare for those emergency backup power operations and thermal safety for passive survivability. The credits will be received on the um, approaches taken for adaptive design of for extreme weather events, the advanced emergency operations such as thermal safety, passive thermal safety, transit and transportation system protection, 
and, environment, and, and environmental protection and remediation for parks and preserves. So this is where we wanted to jump into a little bit of what Kuberry is working on to kind of make that decision easier, provide some data, and, and, and really look at really what's, what are the, the, the kind of the, the complexities that are really preventing projects from really incorporating and evaluating adaptation measures in preparation for extreme weather events and climate change. This is part of a NCHRP, excuse me, NCHRP or Natural Cooperative Highway Research Program project that Dewberry supported. We developed a hazard adaptation framework that followed the FHWA HIC 17 approach. And we really looked at what level of damage is associated with an, an event of a given magnitude and that assumption that that magnitude will remain the same. We assume that the return period for the event will decrease due to climate change impacts. Pretty much the same event will now be more frequent as a result of climate change. And we wanted to kind of give two study level options. One analysis uses three sets of data points and interpolates between them to estimate a threshold value for cost-effective adaptation. And a second level really adds more data points, provides a greater level of accuracy, and adds that benefit-cost ratio. Um, one of the end products was really a guidebook for decision makers to help them understand and make decisions on why and when to consider adaptation. Some of the contents included the economic factors of the cost of benefits of adaption methodologies, those climate change considerations, typical costs and benefits including, included in CBAs for natural hazard events, and really kind of some examples on, on how to approach the level one and, and level two analyses. So with that, on when to consider hazard adaptation, there's a very nice flow chart and kind of process of, of kind of to step through and really to, to drive down that decision making process in order to write a very defined roadmap of what it looks like to consider adaptation through a process and really associate it back to the risk of a project and that project lifespan and likelihood of an event occurring. So when should the different study levels be implemented? So for one and two, really want to consider that adaptation, adaptation strategy to address risk identified, really account for that full life cycle of costs. Some factors to, to in, consider include cost, inexpensive projects may not warrant a CBA, but the more complex projects really are where you start to see those exponential benefits in taking those adaptation measures into account during design. And, so, and ultimately, we concluded that you know, with the increasing, increasing severity of weather events, there are really the potential for serious losses and costly impacts on transportation infrastructure, as well as the built environment. And that's when we really want to make sure that there are processes in place to, to take into account the cost and benefits of adaption measures and really make that decision easier for communities and, and then would in turn be able to really feed into that rely process. So if a project can demonstrate that there is a significant benefit of including adaptation and that further supports the incorporation and application of the RELY rating system. So I wanted to wrap up with some of RELY resources. Um, for more information, we can go to the gbci.org slash RELY website. It's fully detailed out. All the certification guides are there. The guidelines are there. The scorecards are there. And there are folks that are, are there if, if anyone needs assistance at any time. So I really appreciate what, appreciate everyone's time this afternoon. Happy to answer any questions um, as I've been able to highlight some of the basics and kind of introduce the Rely rate Resilience Rating System and touch on some work that Dewberry is doing to really kind of make it easier to determine when adaptation measures for hazards are really needed um, to determine when and where and how to incorporate those design measures um, to really increase resilience. So thank you again, and I'm looking forward to your questions. David, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, we've got a number of questions uh, coming into the chat box here. Um, I think I'll have you start with, uh, you had posted a link. Uh, if folks want to learn more about Rely, 
Um, and, and there was also a, a, a link posted uh, about NCHRP. Uh, could you talk about that a little bit? Thanks, Steve. Yeah, I'll, I'll start off by saying um, appreciate the opportunity here and wanted to make a couple of acknowledgements. Um, Jane France uh, could not be here today to uh, introduce the Rely system uh, in her work on the um, steering committee and work group through the U.S. Green Building Council. And also wanted to acknowledge Laurel McGinley for being the principal investigator on the NCHRP project um, that I highlighted in the, the, my talk earlier. So um, on Rely, yeah, that, that link that I provided, Steve, really kind of goes through some more specifics. You can get a lot of information there, how it really links up with LEAD. Uh, I did see a, a question regarding LEAD. So that is the, uh, the um, design kind of standard of, of energy efficiency, be, meaning leadership in energy and environmental design. Um, and LEED is um, required prior to getting your uh, a RELY certification, which is in its pilot phase right now. It is available um, for a new construction. Um, and all of the, the, the additional data that kind of backs up and, and really kind of goes through the workflow and how to get certified, the steps to be taken, the review process is outlined very clearly on um, the GBCI's website um, with the link that I provided in the chat. Um, and then moving on to Steve, your kind of next question on the NCHRP. So that's um, really the uh, National Cooperative of Highway, um, sorry, <laughs> Highway Research Program. And so there was a project that um, Laurel McGinley did with Dewberry um, to really look at um, how and when to make a decision using a benefit cost assessment um, on when hazard adaptation, specifically riverine um, increases due to climate change um, are, are warranted and really providing some a good tool and a simplified approach so it really isn't such um, a burden on um, DOTs and others that are looking to kind of make that step include that in design and be more resilient um, and going along with a theme with rely since the um, hazard adaptation is one of the highest scored categories um, the, the approaches there can certainly be taken out and, and really kind of pulled into that process and really highlighted to see when and where it is appropriate to include those hazard adaptation measures to be more resilient um, when you're considering making significant investments in projects. Great, I'd really be interested in checking out the NCHRP because uh, being from Ohio, uh, I, it's uh, tough for us to find uh, good data on how climate change is going to affect a lot of our riverine environments. You know, there's a lot of work with sea level rise on the coast uh, and whatnot, but uh, it's very difficult to find data uh, for for riverine systems. And uh, so I, I think uh, our Department of Transportation would be very interested in uh, in that link as well. Yeah, the, um, the tool used specifically in that project was um, um, just an EPA tool called SwimCat. So Really, it's the swim model um, that, and then that cap piece really kind of brings in an estimation and adjustment for discharges based on the, the, the climate data from CMIP three. Um, so it's it, it's 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 really you know understanding that, like you said, the uncertainty around some of the riverine impacts to climate change are large. But at least it's an easy way, it's an easy tool to kind of quantify um, how those return periods can basically become more frequent um, for your more routine discharges. And as you can, as, as you see those impacts start to increase, you can see damages increase, um, you know, at those, at those recurrence intervals that may not have caused as much damage in the past. So. Okay, great. Um, so uh, what do you uh, think might be some of the, the future applications of RELY? Well, you know, my biggest takeaway with the RELY system as I started familiarizing myself um, with it over the last couple of months was really um, that socialization aspect, um, similar to LEAD, is that, you know, you know, as you know, you see those types of certifications out on buildings, that's typically, you can even see it on a plaque when you're walking in, you're like, what is that? What does that mean? Um, and I feel like LEAD itself has really gotten a lot of foothold, a lot of traction, and it's very widely recognized in communities, in companies, in businesses, as, as it kind of being a way to brag about um, how, you know, what they're doing, how, what's important to them, in their culture on, on like what they want to do to to be more energy efficient and and with rely it brings that resilience um, aspect into that same socialization so bringing that awareness to the ability to plan for prepare for and, and better adapt to a changing environment and be more resilient i think is a way it's a huge opportunity to really socialize resilience 
beyond kind of our community of practice and, and really bring it into more of um, like, you know, we, it's, it's another opportunity to keep kind of keep score. Like I mentioned earlier, people love keeping score. And, you know, if you can say like, I've got this score, you know, it's just, it's just another way to really kind of, kind of, kind of get that camaraderie in communities and in, within business um, to really kind of sh shed more light on what's possible when, when being resilient. Absolutely. And then some other applications I can see would be um, kind of bridging to FEMA on the FEMA uh, lifelines that are highlighted extensively in preparedness, um, kind of seeing the overlap there and identifying ways to to ensure that those lifelines are being met when, um, you know, a development's going in, whether it's a larger development or individual buildings, making sure those lifelines are highlighted. And also um, the opportunities for the insurance industry to start looking into what, um, uh, you know, a higher resilience ratings score coupled with a lead score could really mean for, um, uh, you know, adjusting rates for, you know, commercial buildings and, and also infrastructure. And then also just bringing in the overlap of, of kind of justifying potentially more robust building codes um, as, as, as these are being implemented in design projects. Right, incorporating the, you know, any unique standards that aren't already part of the building codes into the building codes on down the line. Precisely. Yeah, you know, and it sounds, you know, they're, they're, uh, the rely is uh, multi-hazard as well. So, you know, we are very much concerned and interested in this group with flooding, but there are uh, other uh, aspects or components to the system as well. Absolutely. I mean, it's a multi-hazard approach, so it's, it is holistic. I mean, we want to consider wind, you want to consider fire, all of those things, uh, earthquake, seismic, um, to, to really kind of bring together all of your potential natural hazards um, and, and really ensure that when those hazards occur, you know, that building can really get back to um, a new state of normal as quickly as possible. And the tenants um, of those buildings are not impacted and can really just persevere through the, the event. Okay, great. We had a couple more uh, questions come into the chat here. Does Rely take into consideration bioengineering using nature to sustain rebuilding? I'd have to, to probably do a little bit of research on the specifics of that. Um, that could be in one of the probably the materials and artifacts potentially category, but um, all of the categories are really kind of, of, of outlined very clearly on the Rely website. Um, and there are, is a quite a bit of flexibility in kind of how you can document and show, um, you know, kind of meeting or an exceeding in one of those categories. So that, that would be an opportunity, I'm sure that could be scored. Okay. Um, have you looked at how RELY relates to the Envision Infrastructure Sustainability Relating System created by AS, ASCE, APWA, and ACEC? Um, yes. So actually, those two pieces are actually part of and inform um, scoring in not only the uh, hazard adaptation category, but a number of other categories. So they are pulling specifically from those two from, from that envision. Um. Okay. All right, let's see if there's any more questions here in the chat box. Okay, maybe one last one. So was there any uh, information uh, that uh, you, you weren't able to fit into your presentation that you'd like to share? Let's see, I think um, a couple of things I'd say just that um, to highlight again, I think I didn't stress enough in the presentation, just the, I think the potential for Rely to really, again, socialize um, resilience as just kind of a culture and a, just a normal way of building and design for the future. Because I think with that just being a common common practice, it's, it's just going to increase that social ability and increase that um, uh, normalcy of, of including resilience in, in all types of development. It only makes sense uh, to do these things. And I know if I was shopping for a building that I would want to look for, uh, uh, you know, the rely stamp of approval. And then the last thing would just be, um, I think the potential for developing simple tools to kind of run through um, specifically the hazard adaptation category and others to really put some good numbers to making decisions so that, you know, 
folks are confident in the decision that they make. I mean, all of these things come with a cost and certainly, you know, communities, developers, um, and, and investors want to make sure that their money is being used and can really can show that benefit. And if, if, if we're not providing ways to show the benefits of including this types of things in design, it's, it's, it's hard to make that argument. So those are the types of things that I think has a lot of potential to be moved forward in the future would be the ways to really show it in writing, show those, show that benefits in dollars to those decision makers to so, so that they can make better informed, resilient decisions uh, moving forward. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much, David. I appreciate you, your time uh, with us this afternoon and, and talking about uh, uh, Rely and very nice presentation. Uh, thank you to all of our presenters today. And, and uh, I hope that uh, everybody enjoys the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thanks, everyone.